Hello, I'm Tim Burkhead. My book is Bird Sets, what it's like to be a bird. This is trying to imagine uh, what it's like to be another kind of organism. Buggered is how most New Zealanders describe their bird fauna, and it is. I've rarely been anywhere where birds are so thin on the air or on the ground. A mere handful of species, several of them flightless and nocturnal, have survived the ravages of introduced European predators and now exist in tiny numbers, mainly on offshore islands. The sun is already setting as we arrive at the lonely quayside. The faint purr of an outboard motor soon materialises into a small boat approaching from the island. Within minutes, we're heading out to sea and into a blazing sunset. The mainland island transition is magical. 20 minutes and we step out of the boat onto a wide, sweeping beach overhung with majestic Bahutakawa trees. Anxious to see our first kiwi, we're out again as soon as we've eaten. The moonless night sky is splattered with stars. With her infrared camera, Isabel scans ahead, and there, hunched amongst the vegetation, is a dark domed shape, our first kiwi. Unaware of us, the bird shuffles forward, foraging like a machine. Touch, touch, touch. As we walk back to the house, the darkness reverberates with the high-pitched squeals of male kiwis. Kiwi, kiwi. What's it like to be a kiwi? How does it feel plodding through the undergrowth in almost total darkness, with virtually no vision, but with a sense of smell and touch so much more sophisticated than our own? When I was doing my PhD a long time ago, I was sitting watching a group of guillemots at very close range, when suddenly one of the birds stood up and started giving the greeting call. And I looked, I thought, this is very odd. They never normally do this unless the partner's present. And I looked out to sea, and amongst the mass of birds that were flying backwards and forwards, I could see a speck hundreds of metres away flying towards the colony. And to my absolute amazement, this bird landed beside the bird that was calling. And suddenly my entire perception of guillemots and birds in general changed. You know, not only has this bird got extraordinary vision, it had been able to recognise its partner when to me it just looked like a speck. The problem was, for me, as a behavioural ecologist, there was nowhere to put that little bit of information. It just didn't fit into the behavioural ecology paradigm. So I just kind of stored it away. And then later, as I became increasingly in interested in the more mechanistic side of behaviour, um, that popped out and that became the starting point for the book. You know, what's it like to be a guillemot? What's it like to be any other kind of bird? So that was the starting point. The book's divided into the, the main senses that we have because our only yardstick in terms of what it's like to be a bird is our own senses. That's the only way we can start. But at the same time, that's completely inadequate because birds have senses that we don't have. And whether you call it a sense or not, one of, you know, an important part of what makes us humans is our emotional sense. And of course, a major question for people interested in animal behaviour, uh, but one that's been out of bounds for many years, is whether animals have emotions. So when Nico Tinberg and Conrad Lorenz were starting the field of animal behaviour in the 1950s, they said, this is out of bounds, you know, we're not going to go there, we're not going to deal with emotion. But I think the field of animal behaviour now has matured so much and we should be confident enough to say, OK, well, we're going to try and tackle this. What I've tried to do as objectively uh, and as scientifically as possible is to present a case that there's something going on in animals, birds' minds that we could call emotion. The magnetic sense is one of the really hot areas of sensory biology and where people are in, currently investing a huge amount of research effort, which is very exciting. And as I say in the book, you know, the results are so startling, you couldn't make this stuff up. And so there's some recent work on um, migrants that are using a magnetic sense to find their way from Europe to Africa um, that suggests that they're perceiving the Earth's magnetic field through the eye. Now, you might think, well, that's OK, but it turns out that it's just through one eye, the right eye. And that is, that is very hard for, for us to imagine. Obviously, I'm very pleased to be nominated for this award. Uh, not least because um, not too long ago one wrote popular science books in one's spare time in secret because it wasn't deemed to be always the most appropriate um, way of spending your time as an academic. I think in recent times as we've made this shift towards more outreach, um, suddenly writing popular science has become more acceptable. I actually see writing popular science as just an extension of my undergraduate teaching. It's exactly the same issue. It's about communicating what are often complex ideas in an accessible 
entertaining and simple way to engage people and to make them enthuse about what I'm enthusiastic about. I think the better our understanding of what it's like to be a bird, uh, the more we'll appreciate the birds and other animals that, are, that there are around us and whatever our relationship with those animals, I think that's incredibly important.